Good afternoon and welcome back to the business show here at London's Excel Centre. I'm joined now by uh, Professor Richard Wilding, OBE, uh, Professor of Supply Chain Strategy at Cranfield School of Management. Uh, welcome, it's nice to meet you. Thank you very much. So how has the business show gone for you so far? Were you here yesterday? Well, I wasn't here yesterday. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was doing another keynote at another event right. up, in, uh, up in Coventry, but that was wow. 1,200 people. But okay. I mean, this is a great event, lots of buzz going on. There is a lot of buzz. And it's very enjoyable doing my uh, doing one of the keynotes here as well. So Good. Have you done your keynote already? I have now, yeah. Yes, I've yeah. already done that one. So okay, we can talk about that a bit more yeah. later. Yeah. So um, let's talk about, uh, it's a very topical issue right now about supply chain. Obviously, given the KFC story, but I don't want to jump straight to that. Um, what I want to talk about, as we're at the business show, focuses very much on small, medium-sized enterprises. Yeah. Let's start by uh, talking about what companies need to think of, kind of early in their their uh, creation about supply chain. Why do they need to think about it? Why is it critical? Yeah. yeah. And then I'll come back with some more questions. Well, I think the thing that we have to recognise is mm. that competition is no longer between individual companies, mm -hmm. it's between the supply chains they're part of. Okay. So really what you have to recognise, I mean you could be brutal and say you're only going to be as good as your worst supplier, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Because what we're talking about is a network of organisations that are being built up. So when you're actually thinking through supply chain, you have to think about your corporate strategy for your business. Mm -hmm. So. You know, one of the things that SMEs sometimes have a bit of a challenge with is really what are we about? You know, make sure you've got clarity around what you are about. Understand how you're creating value for your customers. You know, what is the thing that you're really giving to your customers? How are you creating value okay. for those customers? Now, once you know how you create value, you then need to think about your supply chain. Because your supply chain is your value delivery system, mm -hmm. as it were. So it's how do we actually deliver that value? And when I'm thinking about supply chains, there's actually four key areas you need to consider. Okay, great. First one is your supply chain process design. Right. So what are the processes associated with it? The next one is your infrastructure and equipment design. So you know, what what equipment do you need? You know, so if you're thinking about, say, a large organization, it's it could be, you know, what forklift trucks, what, you know, do I need automated warehousing, sure. do I need this, do I need that? You then need to think about your information systems, how you're actually going to communicate across that supply chain network, but then also the organization, you know, which are, which are the suppliers you're going to actually work with, and so on and so forth. So there's actually those four areas you need to sort of consider. And that becomes really, really important because that is, you know, the basic foundational blocks of that value delivery system. Okay. So if you think about it, if your business proposition is that you want to be able to deliver to a customer within, I don't know, 24 hours, you're going to need processes which can respond within 24 hours, but you need, you know, equipment and infrastructure. So you might need to have you know, a location where you can actually make sure that you ship that item very, very quickly within, you know, to those customers within that 24 hour period. The information systems need to respond in that way and your organization does. Okay. But if we take to the next extreme, mm -hmm. if you're wanting to do it within, say, an hour, that will also have a different infrastructure, different processes, different information systems and potentially a different way of organizing. So, as I said, start off, have clarity in how you're creating value, then once you're clear on that, then you can say, how can the supply chain help you deliver that value? Okay. That's what you're trying to do. Okay, it's a very symbiotic, isn't it, really? Because if you look at a company like Amazon and they decide, we want to ship things out in one hour, you know, if the infrastructure doesn't exist for that, if the supplier network isn't there and requires investment to do it, then you almost could look to Amazon and say, well, they put the investment into that supply chain network to help make it happen. It's not that they turn to their supply network and say, this is what we need. Do you see that? Yeah, so I mean, it is actually quite important because there is a feedback loop between mm -hmm. the supply chain strategy and those elements and your competitive strategy, you know, how you're creating value. 
So, you know, if I turn around today and I said, right, at the business show, we're going to, you know, we're going to provide all the soft drinks for everybody and we're going to, you know, set up this and we're going to have a little soda stream here, you know, sort of doing that type of activity. Which would be great. Yeah, which would be great, actually, you know, having a rather fizzy water or bottled water. Um, what, what, what we could then do is we could, you know, could we do it? Could we do it? Have we got the infrastructure to be able to do that here? And we might go, well, no, not really. Just one soda stream. It's not going to feed all these thousands of people with the soft drinks that they devise. So we might say, well, OK, let's go back around the loop into our competitive strategy. Could we just supply this row of booths, for example, and let's start off there with a supply chain to sort of keep everybody in this little area around here with fizzy drinks? And then that goes back and say, well, yes, we could do that. So there is an iterative process between what have you got in terms of your processes, infrastructure, information systems and people, and how you can compete. And I think we know that, but often there's a disconnect in a business between those people who are doing the competitive strategy and thinking about the value creation, you know, your commercial teams, marketing and sales teams. They sort of say, this is how we're going to compete. And then they turn around to the supply chain people and say, do this. Mm -hmm. But actually, there needs to be that dialogue which takes place and good collaboration internally within the business so that everything is aligned uh, strategically. Do you see that being done better? How good do you think particularly smaller and medium-sized companies are at doing that? Has it improved? Is it something that is recognised more as now a source of competitive advantage? and not just a process to water goods? I think one of the big advantages for a small, medium enterprise uh, businesses is community, you know, you've got generally, if it's a small business, you've got easy communication. There's generally good you communication. Should have, yes. You yeah. should have good communication. You're not talking about some monstrous global entity. So you're able to actually join those, and it might be the same person responsible for both the you know, thinking through the competitive strategy and also the delivery side of things. But I think really for small businesses, they do need to think very carefully about how that process takes place. So, you know, at Trumpfield School of Management, where I'm a professor, often if we are getting SMEs here, just taking them through the basics of strategy and understanding those elements, often they're doing it, but they haven't got frameworks right. to hang this on. and. If you think about it, what we're able to do is facilitate that discussion. And if there aren't any holes in the way that they're going about things, you're able to enable them to say, oh yeah, we need to do that to reduce the risk of us getting it wrong. Because there's a lot of risk in this, right? Well, there it's is a, a risk, area of yeah. risk in business, yeah. I mean, if you've got high growth businesses, for example, you've got to make sure that your supply chain remains capable over a period of time. Well, let's talk about that because yeah. as businesses grow, there could be an assumption that you've got 10 lines you know, and you need 20, so you just double, right? Yeah. But is that the case for most businesses or as they grow, do their supply chains undergo very radical transformations into something completely different? Well, I think that you have to recognise that they can, it depends on the market that you're actually feeding. So what you're finding now is, you know, you have to, having to make deep, big decisions around the whole nature of where you locate things in your infrastructure. So you might be a nice UK based business, which is, you know, producing a particular product. So you might say, well, my own market is UK. All of a sudden you decide, well, we're going to go European or we're going to go global. That's going to have big, you know, in terms of infrastructure processes, financial systems, information systems, it's going to have big implications. And you have to be able to think through those stages, or even if you're moving stuff, you know, to another location. And that's why partnership then becomes very, very important. Right. Because you as a small business now, you've got the opportunity to play big business games, you know? So you, you think about various services which are out there, like Amazon Marketplace, what you're effectively doing is, is you're buying into Amazon's logistical capability. You want to do that which is so, mind-blowing right? which is which is mind-blowing what do you think about ebay now you know on ebay you can you now you know you can basically set it up so that you can deliver click and collect into argos stores in the united kingdom yeah yeah so all of a sudden you're a small business and now you can do click and collect you can do this you know but i'm 
partnering with the right supply chain partners, you're able to offer an awful lot of service and create a lot of value for customers. Yeah, and the whole fulfillment piece is yeah. done. What I find fascinating is these kind of dropship companies where you can start a website and as an individual, you can have a product line which is coming from different manufacturers and there's a supply chain to customers and actually you never see the product, you yeah. never touch it, you don't handle the delivery, you just process the transaction. And what has to happen behind the scenes to make that occur is yeah. incredible. And there is a word of warning around this as well, because if, what you've got to remember is if you are an internet-based business, who is the one person that the customer may see? It's only you. Well, the, the supply chain behind it, they well, see your website. It could be the delivery driver. Uh -huh. oh, that right, could be the sure. only physical person you sure. meet. Now, if you think about it, that delivery driver is therefore representing your company. 100%, yeah. So if you go for the cheapest possible delivery, you know, and you have some chap turning up who doesn't really care and he's, you know, not paid enough and everything else, he's not going to be a great customer service professional, is he? And he's actually going to be reflecting your business. So, you know, sometimes as a small business, you might say, well, I want to actually offer a premium service. So you might actually want to go for slightly more expensive mm -hmm. delivery because then you know you're going to have professionally trained drivers, drivers who are actually focused on customer service and so on and so forth, rather than, you know, bargain basement is, all they're going to do is literally throw it over a wall, yeah? So you have to sort of think through that as well in terms of what's going on because your service is being represented by your supply chain partners. So don't overlook that, you know, if you're not careful, you'll outsource all your customer service to somebody else and you'll lose control of it. So you have to sort of think through how you manage that as well. It's so true that you see online reviews where people will make a review of a delivery, but it's a review of the company they bought from. Yeah. This company delivered really poorly, and actually it was down to a, a supplier. Yeah, a, 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 it could be a supplier so a huge area of risk. That, yeah. Which is this whole, that you know, as I was saying at the beginning, competition is not between individual companies, it's between the supply chains they're part of. So if you can partner with the best, you can create a very efficient and effective supply chain, uh, which works very well. And you know, there's lots of options out there, lots of, lots of people who you can work with out there. It might be a small supplier, mm -hmm. but you're able to actually plug into those networks. Which is exciting, right? Yeah. Let's talk about a very simple uh, topic, which is Brexit. Um, in terms of this kind of supply chain challenges that people have, because Things happen obviously on a continental and global scale now, and I guess it's the same for supply chains. Um, things are crossing borders. Yeah. Kind of you obviously uh, have a lot of exposure to this whole area, right? And have, I guess having lots of discussions around what the potential future is uh, based on UK business. The businesses that are based in, in the UK, where do you see the, the kind of the top risk factors? Well, for I'll, their I'll talk chains? about it very much from a supply chain perspective. And we can keep okay? it simple, yeah. You know, from a supply chain perspective, yeah. Brexit is simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the thing which confuses everything is getting a load of politicians and lawyers involved, mm -hmm. right? Which is which is the challenge that we're in at the moment. Yeah. You know, as soon as you bring all that in, it makes it a little bit it more never complicated. Gets done. Yeah. yeah. However, from a supply chain perspective, what you have to sort of think is is that Brexit is really a supply chain disruption, mm -hmm. but with two years' notice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're thinking about global supply chains, we get disruptions all the time. So in fact, you know, I mean, research shows that, you know, uh, typically 10% of supply chains are disrupted because of various things. Okay. Now, you know, if we have a volcano going off or we have an earthquake or a tsunami, that can disrupt your supply chains. Brexit is another potential disruption to the effectiveness of your supply chains. So one of the key things you need to do, and it's interesting, and this has been something I've been talking about ever since the Brexit mode, is you need to understand where your customers are, and also where your suppliers are, and what the logistical flows are within that environment. So you know, you need to be able to actually map your supply chain out. So as a small, medium enterprise, do think through where are your customers located, where are your suppliers located? Because that can help you understand the level of exposure you will have to the Brexit issue. I mean, for example, you know, if you're buying all your stuff from, I don't know, China, the US or something like that, actually Brexit's not going to have much of an impact on you. And if all your customers are in the lo those locations, it's not going to have a big impact on you potentially. So you just have to sort of think through that. What you generally find is, is that people find the easiest, most effective way to actually move products through. Mm -hmm. Customs regulations are done on a risk-based 
uh, you know, analysis. So one of the important things which all businesses can think about now is that within Europe there is a concept called authorised economic operator, AEO status. Okay. Now AEO status is done at a customs level and also a security level. And if you combine those, what that means is if you create a supply chain like all your partners are AEO you know, accredited, that means that the supply chain will be a lower risk supply chain, which then means that even if we have a hard Brexit, it'll mean that you'll be more frictionless than other organisations. So there are things that we can do now to prepare for Brexit. And AEO status, the similar sorts of approaches which go on in the US, Canada and other, other places, which basically give you, um, you know, it's like a priority pass through customs okay. and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, you know, have a look at that, understand where organisations are, and just think about it as a, a potential supply chain disruption. You know, where are your customers? Where are your suppliers? What are the logistical flows? You might want to adjust those. Yeah? You might want to actually sort of think about, well, I might need to have additional um, you know, resource in certain places and just think through those things. But you know, if you look at the basics of supply chain risk management and if, you know, if people want to have a look at my website, mm -hmm. which is richardwilding.info, there's a few blogs actually there oh, great. around you know, some of these issues. Yeah. And also you know, on LinkedIn, I've got some blogs on you know the Brexit issues, so there's plenty of material out there okay. just to help guide companies in that in that way, particular okay. way. Great, thank you for that. Uh, let's move on to a different topic, uh, which is technology, um, which is obviously moving at an incredible pace yeah. now. How is that disrupting supply chains? Where do you see the biggest technology innovations that are happening? We talked a little bit about this earlier, but yeah. how is it making things easier? How is it making things harder? Well, I mean, I think that the disruption is, you know, the, what it's enabling us to do. If you think about any of these technologies, mm -hmm. going back to what I was talking about in terms of supply chain strategy, what these things do is they change the nature of the processes, infrastructure equipment, information systems, and the organization. So if I look at additive manufacturing, 3D printing, what that actually means is, is that now I can have local small footprint manufacturing maybe close to the customer. Sure, yeah. yeah. So rather than having to have, say, a, you know, manufacturing everything in, say, Asia or somewhere like that, what I can do is I can have these small manufacturing facilities actually based close to the customer, for example, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and potentially now, what, in the future, in their own homes. Yeah, or in their new mm. old, own homes. Now, what does that do for the supply chain? Mm. Of course, what it means is I'm no longer having to go through customs, mm. go through borders, oh, go sure. through this, go through all those other things. And we're already seeing this with some big organisations. So Nike, for example, announced that what they're doing is, is they're actually going to take, well, do a load of time compression on their supply chain. So they're wanting, their current model is about 60 days. Oh, really? Yeah, the, you know, to go through their supply chain, taking it down to 10 days. Now, when you actually look at what they're saying is they're digitising the supply mm -hmm. chain. Part of that is they're getting 1,200 small footprint manufacturing units the benefit of that to them is they're not going to have to go cross-border and things like that because they'll put them locally in that environment. They're saying that is going to result in 30% 30, 30 less steps in, in, you know, in their processes for wow. making trains. Which is a huge but, saving. But also, here's the interesting one, 50% yeah. less labour. Now, their current model has a million workers employed in it. Wow. Right in their supply in, chain. In their supply chain, there's a million workers in that part of their that supply chain. They're saying 50% less labour, half a million people losing jobs. Now, this raises a whole thing. This is which, a huge topic. Yeah. yeah, this is a huge topic because there is, when I think about supply chains, the decisions we make, yeah. we need to think about the economic impact, mm -hmm. which is you know profits. We also need to think about the environmental impact which is the planet but we also have to think through the social, social impact sure. and the people so some of these things these decisions we're making they might make us very profitable they might be very environmental because if you're not moving all this stuff around the planet it's actually going to be you know good for the planet as well but don't forget the social impact and I'm that's really something which that. we're we're having to all sort of wrestle with mm -hmm. on some of these uh, some of the decisions which are being made 
So there's loads of these technologies. I mean, another one which is really coming on stream is blockchain. Mm -hmm. You know, and we hear a lot about blockchain and, you know, people think of Bitcoin. But blockchain technology is really, it's like an operating system. It's mm -hmm. like Windows or your Mac, uh, you know, operating system. It's just a platform on which you can build things. And in the supply chain world, we're starting to have apps that run on that platform. Now, what's great about blockchain is, from a supply chain perspective is, if you're buying stuff somewhere in the world, you can then see where it's been all the way through. It's all there. It's, you know, bits of the data are all locked together. So think about it, going back to authorized economic operator status, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, coming into customs, customs could have a key to open all the data to see where this thing's been. But your suppliers could have a key to open the data. So actually, technologies like that as well can also make things more secure and make things more exciting for your customers mm -hmm. because you can they can see the providence where that item has actually come from. Um, you know, so it can reduce counterfeiting and creates all sorts of opportunities. So some of those technologies are also really coming on stream. Autonomous vehicles as well. I mean, we're talking about you know having automated vehicles you know we're talking about drone delivery it's already happening yeah. in some parts of the world on on delivery so i mean there's some really interesting work which the age agencies are doing around flying maggots around believe right. it or not in africa medical maggots you know you've got a wound so sure. one of the yeah. ways they treat them they yeah. put maggots to eat the infection out yeah. and so they're literally putting these onto little drones and flying That's them amazing. to remote places so you know these are changing the way that supply chains are working and really creating opportunities for society but it does mean that the old ways you know if you think that your old processes your old infrastructure equipment your old information systems your old organization is going to be able to cope with that it's not going to work you're going to have to adapt it to the way these new technologies come on the street and some of these legacy systems are obviously very capital intensive um, there's a lot of manufacturing there's a lot of facility based yeah. investments so switching those over to new technologies is of course a yeah so you know taking it cloud-based that's yeah. a real opportunity once again for small medium enterprises because what you're able to do is to take these things onto the cloud you know and you can buy software as a service so in other words you're saying well i'm doing this many transactions and you just buy you know that many you know yeah. the service so as your business expands you just buy a bit more service so you're not owning the stuff you know they're doing all the updating and everything else a bit like web i mean you know my my, my website you know I, i'm on a particular platform yeah and before you used to have to buy a certain amount of bandwidth sure yeah. now i don't need to worry about that if all of a sudden everybody after watching this decides to hit my site uh -huh. what we'll see is is that they you know they allow me it to have flex that bandwidth it. yeah, yeah. flexes yeah. you know i don't get charged anymore for it great that's brilliant. So we've got seven minutes left. Um, I want to talk about uh, the KFC uh, story. <laughs> yes. I won't call it a yeah. scandal, the story. Yeah. So I guess this was, it was very topical for you, very interesting I guess, at the professional level when it happened because it really put the supply chain issues that can occur yeah, into I mean, the I press. Think, you know, I mean, I think this is one of the things where, you know, traditionally what people thought was that you had KFC and you'd have like KFC lorries delivering KFC exactly, yeah. chicken from the KFC yeah. farms and the KFC lettuce was being grown in the KFC farms and everything else. What this actually highlighted is, is that, you know, going back to, you know, that particular situation, what you've got is supply chain partners involved, okay, but there's different partners for different parts of this. So the processes may be actually owned by KFC. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure and equipment was actually being owned by a different company because right. they'd said, you know, they'd actually said to, you know, the big provider there, which was DHL, you know, you look after that bit there. DHL was then working with another company who was doing the software, the information systems. And then if we actually look at, you know, the people side of things, you'll probably find that some of the people were being maybe run through agencies and things like sure, that. Yeah. So what you've got is, is that now within modern supply chains, different people, different organizations are all responsible for maybe different elements of the supply chain. And one of the challenges is, because of the way that they're structured, if things go wrong, it can go horribly wrong. And I mean, and that's effectively what happened with this. So, you know, what's interesting about this, that, you know, the, the original model, because when you're doing logistics tendering, you know, so effectively what happens is, is KFC, 
they were with their current provider, Bidvest. They then said, we're going to put this out to tender, mm -hmm. so you know we'll see who wants to actually bid for this work yep. in managing our supply chain. Um, in October 2017, the announcement was made that you know DHL and I think it was QSL, Quick Service Logistics, they had got the work, mm -hmm. and then it went live in um, on the 14th. It was Valentine's Day, the 14th of February 2018, and then everybody knows that you know chicken did just get around. We had this massive social media storm. People contacting the police because they couldn't get KFC and so on and so forth. So this created a big you know, a big disruption and it took a long time to actually re-stabilize the supply chain. It also involved that, you know, the original uh, bit of bid vest, they came in and took some of the stores because there was 900 stores. So I think they've taken a proportion of the stores back okay. in the north of England. Yeah. Um, you know, the other people are providing it. So it was a, it was a really tricky thing. I think the key things that you, we can learn from this yeah. is just understand Supply chains are complex things. Different people may be responsible for different elements. It's critical to manage the tendering processes appropriately and have, if you like, effective risk management in place when you do the handover. Mm -hmm. Notice you might phase the handover. What you also need to think through is then the relationship management. And interestingly enough, there's actually an international standard now, ISO 44001, which mm -hmm. was launched about this time last year. You know, in 2017, and what that actually looks at is how to manage collaborative business relationships. One of the important stages in that is defining up front with your supply chain partners your exit strategy. You know, so we have to accept that at some point we're going to get divorced. So, what information does needs to be passed on to the new people? You know, the new people. What other things need to? How do they need to work with the new people so you can hand over these things? So, all those things need to come together in order to make this work. So, relationship management, because actually, you know, a great definition for supply chain management is supply chain management. It's all about the management of relationships with all stakeholders to reduce costs for the supply chain as a whole, but to increase value for the final customers. Great. I think that's a really good message to end on. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to meet you. It's been a pleasure.